In this screencast, we will be discussing the proper positioning of endotracheal tubes. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to identify and describe the proper placement of an endotracheal tube and understand the common incorrect positioning and know what the next step is for managing a misplaced tube. We will review normal anatomy, discuss proper positioning, cover complications of improper positioning, and talk about different variations. When we discuss normal anatomy for endotracheal tube placement, the carina is the most important structure. The carina in adults is located at approximately the T5 to T7 vertebral level. The endotracheal tube tip should come in and be approximately five centimeters from the carina, although there is some variability depending on the positioning of the neck. In flexion, the tube may go deeper, and in extension, the tube may move up. So there is a plus or minus two centimeter range for proper positioning. The endotracheal cuff should be below the true vocal folds as it can damage the true vocal folds, and the cuff should not impress upon the walls of the trachea, but should be lightly inflated just to provide a seal. When we look at the normal anatomy on a chest radiograph, here we see the outline of the trachea, we can see the vertebral bodies in the background, and the carina occurs right at the T6, T7 disc space in this person. With the endotracheal tube in place, we have a five centimeter distance between the carina and the trachea. Here is a real world example. Pause the screencast if necessary and decide whether you think this is an appropriately positioned endotracheal tube. We see the tube well demarcated by a bright white line, which helps increase the visibility of the endotracheal tube. This white line terminates in appropriate position, approximately five centimeters above the carina. So this is a well-positioned endotracheal tube. Here's a slightly more difficult example, predominantly because of the overlapping lines and tubes that we see within the screen. Pause if necessary and decide if you think this is an appropriately positioned endotracheal tube. First, we see a subclavian catheter. We see a nasogastric tube. There are also overlying pacemaker defibrillator leads, but our endotracheal tube is defined or delineated by this thick white line. We cannot see the carina in this patient due to technique, but if we think about where the carina should be, we can decide that by counting the ribs. As we get down to the sixth or seventh rib, we know that the carina should be approximately between T6 and T7, or possibly T5 and T6. Either way, this is an appropriate position. We can also see the endotracheal balloon is below the vocal folds, and so this should be adequately positioned, despite our inability to properly see the carina. Now take a look at this example and decide where you think the endotracheal tube terminates. Again, we see the endotracheal tube delineated by a thick white line to distinguish it from the other lines of the enteric tube and the internal jugular central venous catheter. In this case, the thick white line is directed down into the right main stem bronchus it goes beyond the carina and is therefore improperly positioned. Take a look at this example. In this case, again, we have overlapping lines and tubes, but we can see the endotracheal tube outlined by that thick white line. The carina is slightly more difficult to distinguish but we do see that the tip of the endotracheal tube goes beyond the carina. In this case, the right main stem bronchus intubation is resulting in collapse of the left lung. Take a look at this example. Where do you think the endotracheal tube terminates? We see the thick white line of the endotracheal tube it appears to be directed just past the carina into the left mainstem bronchus. 
A subsequent radiograph shows repositioning of the endotracheal tube. Do you feel like this is appropriate position? I believe it is still too low, as the tip of the catheter appears to project right at the carina. A follow-up radiograph now shows the tip of the catheter approximately 5 centimeters from the carina in an appropriate position. Now I'll take a look at this example and decide if you think the tube positioning is appropriate. This is again a challenging case because there are multiple overlapping lines and tubes, but when we identify the thick white line that demarcates the endotracheal tube, we see the catheter terminating near the thoracic inlet. This is quite a distance from the carina and likely places the endotracheal cuff in the region of the true vocal folds. This catheter needs to be positioned and is too high. Here's another interesting example. Take a look at this and see what you think about the endotracheal tube positioning. Here we have a subclavian line. We can see the endotracheal tube outlined by this thick white line. And interestingly, the tube appears to project lateral to the trachea. We can also see in the lower corner of the image a markedly distended stomach. This represents esophageal intubation and after repositioning we can see the catheter following the course of the trachea and terminating above the carina in good position. Now take a look at this example and decide what you think about the positioning of the catheter. In this case, we can see an internal jugular line and the endotracheal tube demarcated by a thick white line. We can see the carina inferior to the terminus of the endotracheal tube, and so this is a reasonable position, but we see a very large inflated balloon that's impressing upon the walls of the trachea. This is over distension of the endotracheal cuff and this is, can be a problem because the overdistended balloon puts pressure on the mucosa of the trachea. And this can cause ischemia and over time may result in tracheal stenosis. So it's important that you do not overdistend your cuff. And if it is this visible or impresses upon the walls of the trachea, that the cuff be assessed for overdistension. There are certain instances in which we want to selectively intubate the right or left lung as opposed to the trachea. This commonly occurs during cardiothoracic surgery and often employs a double lumen endotracheal tube that allows for selective intubation and ventilation of the right or left mainstem bronchus. In this case, we see the white line of the endotracheal tube, but we see some additional structure to the tube that is headed down that left mainstem. If we zoom in on that image, we see these two rings demarcating the dual lumen of the tube coursing into the left mainstem bronchus. In pediatric patients, the appearance of the endotracheal tube should be similar to that in adults, but the sizes are smaller. The crina is often located higher in pediatric patients. Our endotracheal tube is similar in appearance. We have an IJ catheter here a feeding catheter there, and then a thick white line demarcating the endotracheal catheter. We see the carina located here and the thoracic inlet located here. In this case, the tip of the catheter is approximately one to three centimeters from the carina and one to three centimeters from the thoracic inlet and is appropriately positioned. Note that the tip of the catheter in pediatric patients has more variability or mobility with flexion and extension also, pediatric tube sizes can be variable depending on the age of the patient, and in neonatal patients, there is no cuff on the endotracheal catheter. Here are two examples of pediatric patients. Take a look at these two cases and decide whether you think the endotracheal tubes are in appropriate position. I would argue that this image shows a catheter tip near the thoracic inlet, which is too high. And this image shows the catheter tip at the carina, which is too low.
In summary, your endotracheal tube tip should terminate approximately 5 cm from the carina, plus or minus 2 cm accounting for neck flexion or extension. If you cannot see the carina, you can estimate it to be located between T5 and T7 in adults. You do not want to see the cuff and press upon the trachea, as this places the patient at risk for chronic tracheal stenosis. In pediatric patients, the endotracheal tube tip should be 1 to 3 centimeters below the thoracic inlet and above the carina.